Number 14, Spencer Pearson. After a rough breakup with her ex-boyfriend, Spencer Pearson, a young woman named Madison Shemitz just wanted to move on with her life. The high school softball star from Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, made it incredibly clear that she was finished with the relationship, but Pearson couldn't accept it was over. According to a criminal complaint filed by Madison's mother, Jackie Roge, in May 2023, Pearson had been continuously following Madison as she drove to school. He even went as far as leaving notes on her car. Roge also accused the young man of harassing her daughter on social media websites, using multiple different fake accounts after Madison had blocked his main page. The concerned mother told investigators that she contacted Pearson's mom about his concerning behavior, and his mother simply said that she would handle it accordingly. Less than a week after this, Pearson showed up at a restaurant where Madison and her mom were having dinner with some friends. They were seated outside in an outdoor dining area when a member of their group spotted Pearson sitting at a table nearby. To avoid an awkward confrontation, Madison and her mother decided to leave the restaurant right there and then. They tried to slip away without getting noticed, but Pearson saw the two get up and allegedly followed them into the parking lot, where he suddenly charged at Madison from behind, attacking her with a knife. According to law enforcement, Pearson pinned the young woman to the ground and brutally stabbed her at least 15 times. Madison's mother and a bystander tried to jump in and help. In the process, they were both injured in the attack. Everyone managed to survive, even Madison, but she was left paralyzed by the attack. According to the most recent updates for this case, she remains hospitalized and is focused on her recovery journey. After being treated for a self-inflicted stab wound to his neck, Peterson was sent to the St. John's County Jail on two counts of attempted premeditated murder and one count of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon causing permanent disability. His case is ongoing, so we'll have to wait and see what sentence he is given. Number 13, Kendra Gill. A young pageant queen from the beautiful state of Utah traded her crown in for criminal charges back in 2013 after her poor judgment landed her in deep trouble with the law. In what they later described as a simple harmless prank, 18-year-old Kendra Mackenzie Gill and three others allegedly threw homemade bombs at their friends' houses and driveways during a nighttime joyride. While responding to reports from several concerned residents about the sounds of explosions, police discovered the leftover remnants of bottle bombs made from tinfoil, toilet cleaner, and water bottles. Luckily, nobody was injured, and the teens claimed that they didn't actually mean to hurt anyone. But still, law enforcement took the situation seriously and charged each suspect with multiple felony counts of possession of an explosive device. After her arrest, Gill gave up her Miss Riverton title and the $2,000 scholarship that she was given with it. But the loss of her crown was nothing compared to the 15 years in prison she could have faced if convicted on all of her charges. All four defendants took a gracious plea deal and admitted to a misdemeanor charge of attempted possession of a chemical device. As part of the chosen agreement, the judge agreed to wipe the charge off their records if they each completed 200 hours of community service and paid a measly $500 fine. Some community members thought it was ridiculous that the teens were initially charged with full-on felonies. Prosecutor Blake Nakamura argued that the charges were appropriate, considering the potential for the bombs to cause serious injury, and that the state could have laid even harsher charges on the defendants if they wanted to, including an enhancement for gang activity. Gill admitted that the prank was a massive, stupid mistake, and that she and her friends didn't think about what they were doing or the consequences until after they got in trouble. Luckily, the outcome gave them a chance to consider it a hard lesson learned and avoid a permanent criminal record. You know what they say, kids will be kids even when they're committing felonies. Number 12, Tipsy Teacher Taunts Police. While responding to a car accident inside a parking garage located in College Station, Texas one night back in 2022, police officers calmly pulled a kindergarten teacher named Allison aside and asked her for her side of the story. She admitted that she'd accidentally rear-ended another vehicle with her car, claiming that the other party had slammed on their brakes suddenly. She also immediately admitted that she had had two shots of alcohol and a beer. Allison repeatedly said that she was fixing her hair when the crash took place and that she was sweaty and uncomfortable because the air conditioning in her car was not working at the time. She also made sure to point out that she didn't want to get too drunk because she had to go into work the next morning. 
When the cop asked her to rate her level of intoxication on a scale from 1 to 10, she placed it at a solid 5. He then asked a woman if she thought she was okay to continue driving, and she said that she thought she would be fine. The tipsy teacher agreed to undergo a series of field sobriety tests, and she actually thought she did pretty well on them, but the officer completely disagreed. He told Allison that he didn't think she was in any condition to drive, so she asked if she could have a friend come and pick her up. It hadn't yet sunk in that she was getting arrested on suspicion of driving while intoxicated until the officer ordered her to put her hands behind her back. After learning that Allison's car was going to get towed, the young woman's boyfriend grew upset with the police and asked why he couldn't just take it home. The officer mentioned that it probably wasn't safe to drive because of the damages from the accident and said that he would arrest the boyfriend if he tried to drive it onto the road. Allison wasn't happy about getting placed under arrest, but she made light of the situation while waiting in handcuffs to be picked up and taken to jail for booking. She even posed for a photo for her social media, and when she called her boss to let them know she might not be coming into work the next morning, she jokingly asked if they would put her mugshot on a t-shirt. While Allison and her friends definitely weren't the most disrespectful group the cops had ever dealt with, they also weren't exactly the most pleasant or polite people they'd met. While standing just a few feet from the arresting officer, Allison's boyfriend told her that she should have refused to take the field sobriety test. But she couldn't undo what was already done, so she continued to cooperate as she was placed inside of a police car and taken to the county jail. Number 11. Isaac Grimes After struggling to make friends or form relationships in high school, a lonely teenager from Colorado Springs named Isaac Grimes was beyond thrilled to be taken under the wing of an upperclassman named Simon Sue. The two met in 1999 and soon started bonding over their shared love of chess and video games. And when Sue invited Isaac to join his Operations and Reconnaissance Agents Club, or OARA for short, the impressionable sophomore more jumped at the chance to get closer to Sue. Isaac saw joining the OARA as a chance to connect with more young men like him and make some desperately needed friends. For the first time in his life, he actually felt like he'd found a band of brothers with shared interests who looked out for one another in times of need. The teenager's parents had mixed feelings about Isaac's quickly developing friendship with Simon Sue. They were glad that their son was finally making friends, but they suspected that Sue might have had ulterior motives and was manipulating their impressionable son. At first, the OARA seemed like a self-improvement group for respectable and like-minded young boys who shared similar values and interests. They were against using drugs and alcohol, and they had a zero-tolerance policy toward racism of any kind. But over time, the club took on paramilitary overtones and became more extremist in its beliefs. Sue allegedly told Isaac at one point that the OARA had ties to the government of Guyana, where his family was from, so the group started training with guns and weapons. There was also a military-like structure, with members having ranks like Lieutenant Major and Lieutenant Colonel. Isaac later went on to claim that Sue made him watch videos of horrifically graphic killings and that on one occasion he was forced to eat and drink until he puked. He would also accuse Sue of forcing him to carry out burglaries and other crimes. Most people would walk away from abusive friendships like this, but the OARA was the only social life Isaac knew, and he didn't want to go back to being lonely. He was also brainwashed into believing that the club was training him to defend Guiani's forces in an upcoming military coup. At some point, Sue allegedly started threatening to kill Isaac and his family if he didn't do what he was told. Believing that the OARA was a massive global organization with powerful connections, Isaac was afraid to go against his leader's orders. During a 2009 interview with ABC, he said that he eventually grew so scared that Simon was watching his every move that he was afraid to even turn the lights on while using the bathroom in his own house. In reality, the OARA was not big or powerful at all. And Simon wasn't the untouchable high-ranking vigilante he depicted himself as. If everything Isaac claimed was true, then the group was definitely dangerous. Based on the young man's allegations, the OARA could be described as a cult 
that targeted lost boys who were so desperate to belong that they were willing to sacrifice anything, including their ability to think for themselves. On New Year's Eve in 2000, Isaac went to the house of his friend, Tony Dutcher. After eating some dinner and playing a game of Scrabble, he approached Tony from behind in their outdoor fort and fatally slashed the boy's throat. Tony's grandparents were used to the boys being outside for multiple hours at a time, so they didn't wonder where Tony was, even after Isaac came back inside the house. He was still there at 4 o'clock in the morning when another friend, John Matheny, drove over to the property and came inside the home. When Tony's grandparents woke up to the commotion, Matheny shot them both dead on the spot. During police questioning, Isaac claimed that Sue ordered him to kill Tony as a way to prove his loyalty to the OARA while he was on so-called probation. Although Sue didn't directly help with the murder, he was held equally accountable for ordering the hit. He denied being a cult leader, and instead of talking up the OARA, he downplayed the group as a simple, harmless boys' club. To avoid a possible life sentence, Sue pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder. He was given a 53-year prison sentence, while John Matheny was sentenced to 66 years for the same charge. Isaac Grimes pleaded guilty to murder and is currently serving a 60-year sentence. In hindsight, he realized how naive he was to believe that a fellow high schooler was running a powerful international paramilitary group. He also realized that he could and should have reached out to an adult for help, escaping the cult environment. But he can't undo what's been done, and at almost 40 years old, he has spent well over half his life behind bars. According to records, Grimes will become eligible for parole in 2026, but could remain locked up until as late as 2056. Number 10. Social Media Feud Leads to Gang Shooting after a social media feud between rival gang members spiraled drastically out of control, a young man from Brownsburg, Indiana named Freddie Hegwood was mercilessly shot to death in December 2020. Hegwood was minding his own business, sitting in a car, when someone pulled up in another vehicle right next to him and fired multiple shots at the young boy. The teenager died from his injuries, and another person in his car narrowly avoided the gunfire. At least one of the bullets hit a nearby home, but thankfully, no one was hurt inside. By the time police officers arrived at the scene, the perpetrators had already fled. But investigators didn't have to look very hard to figure out what led up to the shooting. They quickly found out that Hegwood had been caught up in an ongoing dispute on social media with a few different people, and that the parties had exchanged vicious insults and threats in the days before the young man's death. Police identified the suspects as Tyreonte Jackson, Kamarian Moody, Jeremy Perez, and Antonio Lane. Three of the men fled the state to California and were captured about seven months after the murder took place. It was unclear who actually fired the fatal shots, but prosecutors held all four suspects equally accountable for the crime by charging them all with murder, attempted murder, and criminal recklessness. Moody, Lane, and Jackson were found guilty and were handed prison sentences ranging from 95 to 140 years, which means that they'll most likely spend the rest of their lives behind bars, all thanks to a social media spat. These three defendants have since appealed their sentences, while Perez was acquitted of all charges. Number 9. Rose May and Tristan Kindle It's common for young couples to romanticize the idea of running away from the law together, but these modern-day Bonnie and Clyde fantasies don't seem so appealing once a pair of fleeing criminals are sitting alone in a jail cell. This was the case for Rose May and Tristan Kindle, who were reported missing in northern Ohio by worried family members in 2015. According to Wyandotte Sheriff Michael Hetzel, the couple had left the state in a stolen pickup truck after stealing some ammunition from a Walmart. The teens allegedly drove to Pennsylvania, stealing one or two more cars along the way while hiding out in the wilderness to avoid law enforcement. A few days into the search for the runaway pair, police in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania responded to a call about an armed robbery taking place at a convenience store. When an officer tried to pull May and Kindle out of a stolen car, they quickly drove away, dragging the cop for a short distance before he finally fell to the ground. Thankfully, his injuries were non-life-threatening and he recovered. Dozens of emergency responders and volunteers then joined in on the search effort, which continued into West Virginia. The suspects were finally placed under arrest in the town of Elizabeth after leading police on a 12-mile chase in a stolen pickup truck. 
After crashing the car, the couple tried to flee on foot, but they had second thoughts about continuing after they jumped into the Ohio River and realized that they probably wouldn't be able to make it across. May and Kindle were then transported back to Ohio, where they were charged with multiple crimes and booked into custody while awaiting their next court date. Number 8. Kevin Watkins after coming back home from school one day and getting frustrated with his family's slow Wi-Fi connection in February 2018, a teenager from Georgia named Kevin Watkins changed the network's password so that his Xbox would be the only device running on the connection. But that simply wasn't going to fly with the rest of the family. Kevin's mom tried taking the Xbox from the boy's bedroom and it somehow led to a confrontation between the young boy and his 19-year-old sister Alexis. Court testimony later revealed that Kevin put Alexis in a chokehold and refused to let her go, even as his brother helplessly tried getting him to release his tight grip on Alexis's neck. More than 10 minutes passed by before police got to the scene and pulled the teen off his sister. Alexis was killed by her injuries, and authorities eventually charged Kevin with murder. During his bench trial, which left his fate up to a judge instead of a jury, Kevin's lawyer argued for a lesser conviction of voluntary manslaughter. The judge found Kevin guilty of murder and sentenced him to serve life in prison. When the newly convicted killer was given a chance to speak up in court, he was sobbing so hard that the only words anyone could actually understand were, I'm sorry, but it was too late to take back what he'd done. Number 7. Mackenzie Shurilla In July 2022, two young lives were needlessly lost and another was forever ruined when an Ohio teenager named Mackenzie Shurilla crashed her car into a building at nearly 100 miles per hour. Mackenzie's boyfriend, 20-year-old Dominic Russo, and a friend, 19-year-old Davion Flanagan, were killed at the scene. When police got there, Mackenzie was passed out with her foot still pressing on the gas pedal. She underwent multiple surgeries, but survived her many injuries. The car was almost completely crushed from the sheer impact of hitting the brick wall. Horrifying footage from just a few moments before the wreck showed the car barreling along a residential street at an alarming speed. After concluding that the crash wasn't a simple accident, authorities decided to charge Mackenzie with two counts of murder. Prosecutors accused her of deliberately crashing the car because she and Dominic were having relationship issues. Black box data from the vehicle indicated that she had the pedal pressed fully down to the floor and made no attempts to ease up on the gas or brake whatsoever. Mackenzie denied killing either victim on purpose and maintained her story that the wreck was unintentional. During Mackenzie's bench trial, which left a verdict up to the judge, not a jury, her aunt testified that the teen and her boyfriend did not have a rocky relationship. But the court heard several audio recordings of Mackenzie threatening Dominic with physical harm, suggesting that the couple had more problems than people were aware of. In an attempt to reduce Mackenzie's culpability, her mother argued that the young woman suffers from a condition that makes her prone to passing out, and that this could have been the cause of the crash. Mackenzie's defense attorneys argued that there was no way of knowing exactly what went down in the car, and that Dominic may have been trying to grab the wheel from his girlfriend's hands. The judge disagreed with the out-of-pocket claim, instead describing Mackenzie as literal hell on wheels, who carried out her deadly mission with precision. She was eventually found guilty of two counts of murder and received a life sentence with a minimum of 15 years. Number 6. Teen Stomped at Target In a brutal act of violence captured on camera, a helpless teenager from Redlands, California was cornered and assaulted by four grown men at Target during the summer of 2023. Video footage of the incident showed the attackers surrounding the victim and taking multiple swings as disturbed witnesses gathered around. In a desperate bid to defend himself, the victim tried taking a punch at the men, but he was hopelessly outnumbered and was quickly tackled down to the floor. The attackers then proceeded to kick and stomp on the victim's head while terrified bystanders called 911. At some point during the clip, the victim could be heard desperately begging the men to stop attacking. 
Police reported to the scene not long after and immediately launched an investigation, but the victim was unwilling to give them a statement. So far, no charges have been filed in the case because of this, and the cause of the brawl remains unclear. This was the second incident of its kind to happen in the same shopping plaza within a month-long period. In general, violence inside retail stores is steadily on the rise, with the target chain being especially hard hit by this problem. The spike comes during an increase in shoplifting among Target stores, which experienced a massive 120% surge in the first five months of 2023 alone. Number 5. Kayla Henriquez 22-year-old Kamisha Richards and 18-year-old Kayla Henriquez were neighbors who grew up together in Brooklyn's Cypress Heights neighborhood. They grew to be close friends over the years, but their bond was finally broken one day in 2011 when Kamisha lent Kayla $20 to buy some supplies for her baby and suspected her of using it for things she didn't actually need. The upset gal pal instantly demanded her money back, and the young women fought for the next three days as they went tit-for-tat on social media, airing out their dirty laundry for all their friends and family to see. At one point, Kamisha got so angry that she decided to go over to Kayla's apartment, take her baby's milk out of the refrigerator, pour some of it out, and say that it amounted to half of what she was owed in money. The disagreement only got worse from there, as the feuding BFFs took things into a nearby bedroom. Just moments later, Kamisha came stumbling out of the room with a single stab wound to her heart. She was quickly rushed to the hospital, where she passed away from her injuries, despite emergency responders and doctors' best efforts to save her life. During police questioning, Kayla said that Kamisha had covered her with a pair of scissors, so she ran to grab a kitchen knife and stabbed her former friend to defend herself. Kayla seemed strangely calm at the start of the interview, as if she didn't understand the seriousness of what had really just happened. Meanwhile, Kamisha's loved ones struggled to come to terms with the realization that the victim had lost her life during a dumb, petty dispute over a measly $20. Prosecutors charged Kayla with her friend's murder, which would have come with a sentence of 25 years to life if convicted. Instead of risking an actual trial, Kayla pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to just 15 years in prison. She'll become eligible for parole next year in 2024. Number 4. Megan Joy Simirowicz it's common for teenagers to act on their decisions without fully thinking them through first, and in some very sad cases, this impulsiveness can have devastating, long-lasting consequences. A 19-year-old woman from Michigan named Megan Joyce Imiruich learned this lesson the hard way back in October 2021, when she became explosively upset at her father and reacted with deadly violence. According to reports, 64-year-old Conrad Imiruich had a pretty bad drinking problem. It was normal for him to be drunk at home, but authorities believe he got extremely intoxicated on the day in question and that Megan had finally reached her breaking point when he was too drunk to drive her to an appointment she'd made at a hair salon. Fed up with her dad's behavior, the teen threw multiple objects at Conrad, including a loaf of bread, and doused him with a deadly mix of lye powder and water while he peacefully napped on the sofa. She then left him there for a few hours as he lay unconscious with severe chemical burns covering his head, torso, and extremities. Conrad was then taken to the emergency room later that day after being discovered by one of Megan's friends and remained hospitalized in the intensive care unit for months as he tried to recover. He was eventually released for in-home hospice care and died just three days later. Authorities charged Megan with felony unlawful possession or use of harmful devices causing death and misdemeanor domestic violence. She was held in custody until her case finally went to trial and she faced a possible life sentence if convicted. A jury found her guilty on both counts, so she was sentenced to serve one year in prison with credit for the more than 500 days she had already served in county lockup. This meant that she walked free and was able to carry on with her life despite being the one responsible for her dad's fatal injuries. In a statement, Megan said that she wasn't the monster the prosecutors tried to depict her as and that her father was her hero and closest friend. Number 3. Disastrous Teens Disrespect Strangers' Home 
A Glendale, Arizona resident was just about to move into his recently purchased home in 2023 when a neighbor suddenly called him and told him that there was a huge party taking place inside the residence. The owner rushed over and was shocked to find hundreds of strangers smoking, drinking, and engaging in other forms of party antics. Trashed with broken glass, garbage, beer bottles, and footprints all over the walls, the home had incurred at least $2,000 worth of damages. The horrified homeowner later informed police officers that he lived alone with his dog and that nobody else would have had a key to the house. Responding officers removed the partygoers from the property and the owner immediately scheduled a professional cleaning appointment for the next morning. But when he got to the property bright and early a day later, he was shocked to find several people sleeping in his bed and all over his house. Police once again had to come to the scene where they surrounded the house with plans to arrest everyone still inside. They could see several people trying to peek through both the first and second story window blinds as they prepared to make their move, and two of the partygoers were caught trying to sneak out of a window and onto the roof. Seven people were arrested that day, and four suspects were hit with multiple charges, including criminal trespassing and criminal damage to the property. At a time that was supposed to be exciting for this new homeowner, he was instead left feeling completely unsafe and worried that he would be targeted again in future break-ins. The incident also made several neighbors uneasy, especially since there were a few vacant homes in the neighborhood at the time, and they feared the troublesome teens might target those houses next. To prevent history from repeating itself, the homeowner equipped his new house with security cameras and started a dialogue with other community members about ways to make sure the neighborhood Hood, stayed safe at night. Number 2. Nadia Swartz and Justin Hooker In March 2020, the body of a young man was discovered along the Conasauga River in Murray County, Georgia. Police were unable to find a wallet, cell phone, or other identifying items near the corpse. The man had been shot three times in the head and one time in the chest. Authorities later identified the John Doe as 27-year-old Kenny Bunn after getting a missing persons report from his grandmother. Bunn left his home to walk to a nearby store the day before and never returned. That same night, Bunn's ex-girlfriend, 20-year-old Nadia Swartz, showed up at his grandmother's house looking for him. Surveillance footage that was captured later on that evening showed Swartz and Bunn crossing paths and talking to each other at a gas station. Bun then got into his ex's car and they drove off somewhere. This was the last known time he was seen alive. Kenny's mother later told the Oxygen series Killer Couples that her son met Nadia Swartz online a few years before his death in 2019. The couple had broken up three or four months before Kenny was killed, but he still had strong feelings for Nadia, so the two remained in contact. He hoped that they would eventually get back together, but within a month or two of the breakup, Nadia started dating 20-year-old Justin Hooker. It wasn't long before the pair moved in together. When confronted about the gas station security footage after Kenny's murder, Nadia told investigators that she agreed to give her ex a ride to someone's house nearby, but she got angry when she learned that Kenny was going there to buy some marijuana. She claimed that she kicked him out of the car along the road and never saw him again. Justin Hooker told detectives that he was at a relative's house the night of Kenny's murder. Law enforcement were still suspicious of the pair, but they lacked enough evidence to make any arrests until a jailhouse informant revealed through their lawyer that they recently sold Hooker a gun. After hearing about Kenny's death, the informant was worried the gun might have been used to commit the crime. During a phone call with the inmate, Hooker allegedly confessed to using the weapon to kill Kenny and admitted that Nadia was with him as he did it. After taking a closer look at Hooker's alibi, detectives determined that he was lying to police about where he was on the night of the murder. Additional investigation revealed a long-standing feud between the victim and the suspects, stemming from allegations that Kenny abused Nadia while they were in a relationship. Nadia claimed that Kenny started threatening to kill her not long after they first got together. On the night of the murder, she and Justin planned to confront Kenny with their accusations. According to Nadia's version of events, Kenny tried to grab and strangle her at the scene, giving Hooker no choice but to shoot the man in her defense. 
but the evidence didn't quite fit with the story. Police observed a lack of injuries, suggesting that Nadia hadn't been strangled or violently attacked. Prosecutors argued that Nadia manipulated Justin into killing Kenny by making him think they wouldn't have a good relationship unless Kenny was completely out of the picture. In reality, there was no valid reason for going to such extreme lengths. With a growing stack of evidence against them, Justin Hooker and Nadia Swartz both decided to plead guilty to murder. They were each sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years. We have another great video lined up right after number one. If you need more of a daily world list dosage, then be sure to stay tuned if you haven't seen that one yet. Number one, Ryan Furlow. A high schooler from Howard County, Maryland, named Benjamin Vasiliev, had no idea he was walking into a trap when he decided to take up an invitation from Ryan Furlow to play video games and watch a movie one night in early 2023. While on a computer in Furlow's basement later that evening, Vasiliev drank a sip of Coca-Cola and had a violent seizure. The soda had been spiked with cyanide, and Furlow had slipped the deadly poison into his buddy's drink while he wasn't looking. Vasiliev passed away from the poisoning five days later, and investigators were quick to suspect Furlow. He soon confessed to the murder during questioning and claimed that he was motivated to commit the crime because Vasiliev wasn't putting the same amount of effort into their friendship as he was. Furlow was especially offended since Vasiliev often failed to give him Christmas and birthday gifts, and on one of the few instances when he remembered, he gave his friend a cookbook that Furlow saw on his bookshelf at home. The disgruntled teen was also offended by the fact that Vasiliev didn't even bother to wrap the second-hand gift. In a normal situation, a friend who doesn't feel that their gestures are being matched will simply scale back on their own efforts to make things fair, or they might try to talk to the friend in an attempt to work out any misunderstandings. But as Furlow silently boiled over with anger for months, he eventually decided that the only viable solution to the problem was to kill Vasiliev. He was quickly charged with first-degree murder. In a chilling confession tape that was played during his trial, Furlow said that he tried really hard to forgive Vasiliev but that his anger ate at him and eventually became impossible to move past. He fully admitted that he felt a strong desire to hurt and take Vasiliev's life. Prosecutors claimed that Furlow was lying about being angry over things like birthday gifts and being taken seriously enough by Vasiliev. Instead, the state argued that Furlow had actually fallen in love with Vasiliev's girlfriend and killed his friend out of sheer jealousy. Furlow's defense attorneys focused their argument mainly on their client's ailing mental health and asked the jury to find him guilty of a lesser charge of second-degree murder or manslaughter. The teen's mother blamed her son's crime on adverse effects from the antidepressants he was taking. Jurors were unconvinced that Furlow deserved even the slightest bit of leniency, and they found him guilty of first-degree murder after deliberating for a little less than three hours. He was sentenced to life in prison with the chance of parole. As of 2023, he is still behind bars. Number 17, Amber Bradley. In June 2016, police in Leighton, Utah, discovered 29-year-old Amber Bradley passed out in her front yard. After realizing that she was under the influence of drugs, officers went inside her house and found four young men passed out next to a stash of beer, weed, Xanax, and drugs. One of them told the police that Bradley gave them alcohol and that they played beer pong, but the group of friends found the weed inside the home. Another guest reportedly said that he went with Bradley to pick up some Xanax pills. Over the next few days, police questioned a young boy who admitted he was having an intimate relationship with Bradley. He claimed that she promised to buy him a dirt bike if he indulged in the inappropriate affair. According to court records, he told officers that he was hesitant to do what she was asking, but he caved to Bradley's pressure and promises of gifts. Bradley was charged with a laundry list of crimes after the investigation, including multiple felony counts of endangerment. In the first of two cases she faced, she took a deal and pleaded guilty to three counts of attempted endangerment in exchange for having charges reduced from felonies to simple misdemeanors. She ended up changing her not guilty plea in another case 
and admitted to two felonies in exchange for getting some charges dropped. The judge sentenced Bradley to a maximum prison sentence of five years. During a parole hearing in 2019, Bradley said she was in a much better mental state than she was at the time of her arrest. After going through a program meant to rehabilitate her problematic behavior, she admitted that she acted with incredibly poor judgment when she committed her crimes and that she was blinded to the behaviors and habits that she now understood were problematic. Bradley also got sober and received counseling. She told her parole board that she truly looked forward to going back to work and that she was even thinking about going back to school to pursue a degree. While it's unclear how she's doing nowadays, her name has remained largely out of the news, suggesting that she's still on the straight and narrow path. Number 16. Cassandra Bohorje and Johnny Ryder when family members suddenly stopped hearing from 63-year-olds Randall and Wendy Bohorje back in April 2017, they decided to call the police and request a welfare check. Officers made multiple attempts to visit the couple at their Lawrenceville, Georgia home, but nobody answered the door and there was no evidence of foul play to justify forcing their way inside. In the meantime, the couple's granddaughter, Cassandra Bohorje, and her boyfriend, 19-year-old Johnny Ryder, were arrested for trying to kill Ryder's parents. This finally gave police probable cause to enter Randall and Wendy's home, where officers discovered their decomposing bodies. The victims' throats were slashed and they had been brutally beaten up with a tire iron. Authorities think that Randall and Wendy were dead for about a week or so before their bodies were located. Someone had taped up the windows and taken other measures to hide the odor of the decaying remains. After a brief standoff with law enforcement, a SWAT team took Cassandra Biorhe and Johnny Ryder into custody on suspicion of murder. Cassandra eventually confessed to the double homicide during a preliminary court hearing. According to prosecutors, the young couple waited outside the victims' homes until all the lights had been turned off for the night and the victims had gone to bed. After going inside, Ryder started beating Randall Bohorje with a tire iron while Cassandra dragged her grandma into the same room, where she tied up the elderly woman with duct tape and hit her. The teens finished the pair off by stabbing them and slicing their throats. They kept the bodies behind a closed door while they spent the next week partying at the home with friends, smoking weed and having all kinds of food delivered. It truly seemed like they felt no remorse for their actions whatsoever. Cassandra Bohorje and Johnny Ryder pleaded guilty to the murders and were sentenced to spend the rest of their lives in prison. Number 15. Tyler Hadley in July 2011, a troubled teenager named Tyler Hadley invited a group of people from his high school to his family's home in Port St. Lucie, Florida for a house party. People were surprised since he had recently complained about how strict his parents were starting to get. Tyler claimed his folks were out of town during the get-together. When someone asked about the possibility of his mom and dad coming home in the middle of the party, he reassured his friends that it would never happen. 60 people showed up, and it wasn't long before everyone got drunk and started destroying the house. At multiple points throughout the night, people asked Tyler where his parents were. He gave a few different stories, causing his guests to joke about how he probably killed his mom and dad. At the time, he was high off of ecstasy, so it was probably easy for his guests to blame drugs for the inconsistencies in his stories. Just weeks earlier, Tyler told a friend that he actually did want to kill his parents and throw a party afterwards. But he was known to act strange and say things that were out of line, so the friend didn't take him very seriously. As the party wore on, he told a few people that he did something bad and that he was going to go away for a long time for it. At one point, he even pulled a close friend aside and said that he murdered his mother and father. The friend noticed the family's cars parked in the driveway and realized that Tyler might not be joking. Tyler then led his friend into the master bedroom, which had stayed locked up tight all night, and revealed a horrific scene. There was blood everywhere, and his parents' corpses were in the room. According to the friend, Tyler said he hid his parents' cell phones so they couldn't call for help and beat them both to death with the claw end of a hammer. The friend stayed at the party for a few more hours, 
before deciding to contact law enforcement. In the months leading up to the murders, Tyler's partying and bad behavior had gotten out of control to the point where he ended up on house arrest. His mother even had him committed under Florida's Baker Act, which allows parents to mandate their children to involuntary psychiatric care. Due to the graphic nature of his crimes, Tyler Hadley was charged as an adult. He was found guilty of the murders and was sentenced to life without parole for what he did. Number 14, Jesse Holton. After finishing up his shift on a Sunday morning back in September 2016, Mike Holton went back to his home in eclectic Alabama and realized that his son, Jesse Madison Holton, had thrown a huge party the night before. After discovering the house trashed and noticing evidence of possible drug use, Mike handcuffed Jesse and called his ex-wife April. As Jesse's mother headed over to the property, Mike called 911 and summoned an officer to the scene. It was apparent to the responding cop that the Holtons had been struggling to discipline their son. The family had a long history of problems revolving around Jesse's erratic behavior. According to Elmore County Sheriff Bill Franklin, and Mike Holton believed his son had a drug problem. After speaking with the family and collecting some evidence, the deputy left a home with plans to come back the next morning with an arrest warrant for Jesse. By then, it seemed like the situation inside the Holton home had calmed down a bit. But just 11 minutes after the deputy pulled out of the driveway and went out to another call, Jesse ran over to a neighbor's house and said that his parents were arguing. The neighbor dialed 911 and the officer came back, only to find what could only be described as a horror scene. Mike Holton was lying dead in his bedroom with a gunshot wound to the head, while April clung to life nearby with a similar wound. She was rushed to the hospital, where she gave in to her injuries the next day, despite doctors' best efforts to save her. Sheriff Franklin described Jesse's demeanor in the aftermath of the shooting as emotionless. He also accused the teenager of showing an eerily disturbing lack of concern for his parents, asking only how his mom was doing and not asking at all about his dad's condition. Jesse fiercely denied killing his parents. He claimed his father shot his mother before turning the gun on himself and that he was still wearing the handcuffs his dad had put on him earlier that day when the crime was committed. Mike had handcuffed Jesse behind his back, which would have made it practically impossible for him to carry out the shooting. But authorities believed that he had somehow managed to slip out of the cuffs or had found the key somewhere, allowing him to commit the double murder. Based on the angles of Mike's wounds, Sheriff Franklin said there was no way he caused the gunshot to his head. Jesse was later charged with two counts of first-degree murder. He continued to maintain his innocence while he spent the next year behind bars at the Elmore County Jail while his case carried on. During that time, Jesse missed both his parents' funerals as well as his senior year of high school. He refused to even consider a plea deal since he did not believe he should admit to a crime he didn't commit. Jesse was released on bond in December 2017, and the case was dropped about 10 months later thanks to a lack of evidence. Prosecutors did not dismiss the charges because they thought Jesse was innocent, but rather because they knew they couldn't prove his guilt. Despite feeling relieved over the outcome of the case, Jesse was worried the sheriff would find a reason to put him back behind bars. So he finished high school and moved out of the area to get a fresh start. Jesse initially planned to become a defense attorney so he could help people who were in similar positions to the one he landed in after his parents' deaths, but based on his social media accounts, it seems as though he joined the military instead. During a Dateline interview, Sheriff Franklin expressed his disappointment in the outcome of the case and said he believed Jesse got away with cold-blooded murder. Do you agree with the sheriff, or do you think Jesse was actually innocent? Let us know in the comments below. Number 13, Halloween Homicide. To celebrate Halloween, Mike Williams used to throw huge costume parties every year at his home in Frenchtown Township, Michigan. The annual bash drew a crowd of hundreds of people, and up until 2014, it was always a good time. Over 600 people showed up to the party on October 25th that year, including 22-year-old Chelsea Ellen Brock, who was thrilled to show off her Poison Ivy costume. Chelsea went to the party with a few friends and stayed until 3 o'clock in the morning. As the crowd thinned out and the party goers started to head home, several of Chelsea's friends offered to give her a ride. 
She declined all of them and everyone went their separate ways. The next morning, Chelsea's parents realized that she failed to come home from the party. They immediately started searching for her with help from the community, who rallied around the family in an effort to find the missing woman. Chelsea's family initially offered a $17,000 reward for information regarding her whereabouts. When it failed to dig up any useful tips, the family raised the reward amount to $30,000 and pleaded to the public for help finding her. In the meantime, investigators questioned partygoers in hopes of gathering some useful info. A few people mentioned seeing Chelsea leave the event that night with a man, but this failed to bring detectives any closer to a helpful answer. Another man who had been seen with her earlier that day was questioned and ultimately cleared of suspicion. Six months after Chelsea's disappearance, her poison ivy costume was discovered at an abandoned industrial site. It looked as if it had been violently ripped off of her, giving investigators the first solid piece of evidence that an attack had taken place. A few weeks later, the young woman's remains were found in a shallow grave near some train tracks at a rural construction site. The killer stayed at large while police continued working round the clock to identify a suspect. In the year after Chelsea's disappearance, investigators carried out 800 interviews, followed up on hundreds of tips, and obtained 34 search warrants. 50 law enforcement agencies helped with the investigation, and civilians stayed equally committed to finding justice for Chelsea and her family. As the one-year anniversary of the young woman's disappearance approached, Mike Williams told the press he would not be hosting his annual Halloween party. He said that he didn't know Chelsea personally, but that he was devastated by her disappearance and death. Williams received a lot of bad publicity early on in the case and also became a key suspect for a brief period during the investigation. Police eventually ruled him out, but he went through a lot before they crossed him off their list. On top of the fact that it would feel inappropriate to host a party at the site, it's probably safe to assume that Williams wanted to put the past year's events behind him and move on with his life. On July 25, 2016, a year and nine months after Chelsea went missing, authorities matched DNA evidence found on the Poison Ivy costume to 27-year-old Daniel Allen Clay. During questioning, he admitted to being involved in Chelsea's death, but claimed it was all an accident. He told police officers that he saw Chelsea walking on the side of the road and picked her up that night, and that they had a consensual sexual encounter. Clay said that Chelsea asked him to choke her during the act and that he suffocated her to death without meaning to. But the young woman's autopsy told a very different story and her death was ruled a homicide by blunt force trauma. Throughout his trial, Clay stuck to his story that he accidentally killed Chelsea and that he disposed of her body instead of calling the police because he was afraid they would accuse him of killing her. Unswayed by the defendant's claims, a jury found him guilty of first-degree murder. He was later sentenced to life without parole. Number 12. Adam Jenkins During the 2021 holiday season, an English businessman named Adam Jenkins hosted his family's Christmas party at his house in the village of New Bottle. The party went well until later in the evening, when Jenkins was woken up from a nap by a loud noise. He went to go check it out and noticed his sister getting beaten up in his living room by her boyfriend, 39-year-old Simon Birch. The men immediately got into a confrontation, but were quickly separated by other partygoers who stuck Jenkins in his kitchen and took Birch outside. While there, Jenkins grabbed three kitchen knives and went outside, where he tracked down Birch and slashed him in the throat. A toxicology test later revealed that the victim had over three times the legal limit of alcohol in his system. Jenkins claimed he didn't mean to hurt Birch and later argued that he had no memory of the attack, but it seemed pretty deliberate to the police, so he was charged with murder. The arrest came as a shock to Jenkins' friends and family, who described him as a nice, peaceful person who was more likely to try resolving a conflict than to go looking for one. Simon Birch had been dating Jenkins' sister for about two and a half years, and the couple had a history of domestic violence in that short time. Jenkins said he thought Birch had killed his sister when he saw her lying unconscious and bleeding on the floor. At that point, he either blacked out with anger or went into autopilot mode, causing him to go after Birch. Prosecutors accused Jenkins of being a violent person, but the judge overseeing the case acknowledged that he seemed like an agreeable man. As a result, he was convicted of a lesser manslaughter charge and sentenced to just eight years in prison. 
Number 11, Deadly Domestic Dispute. Married couple Ashley Henning and Jordan Michael Henning were both active duty members of the U.S. military. They were stationed at Fort Knox in Kentucky in June 2023 while celebrating Ashley's 37th birthday at their home in Rhineville. They got into a heated fight in front of both their children and guests. Neighbors who were at the party later told police that the couple were drinking when the argument broke out and that they tried to calm the two down. After failing to de-escalate the situation, they grew concerned for the safety of the couple's children and removed them from the home. Shortly after leaving, they heard gunshots and noticed Jordan Henning leaving the scene in his car just moments later. The neighbors then went into the home and found Ashley dead on the ground from multiple gunshot wounds to the torso. Police quickly caught up with Jordan and took him into custody. According to law enforcement, he quickly apologized for hurting his wife during the arrest. He now faces one count of murder, domestic violence, and could face anywhere from 20 years to life in prison if convicted. Number 10, Graciela Gomez. It doesn't take much for a house party to get out of control, especially with how fast word spreads on social media these days. This was certainly the case for a Halloween party in 2021 at a home in Las Vegas, where droves of people showed up after reading about the event online. As the house became increasingly packed, the host started patting people down as a safety precaution before letting them inside his house. When a group of men showed up after midnight and refused to get patted down, the host turned them away at the door. Angry that they were refused entry, the group got into a car and shot at the house with guns as they drove away. A bullet hit 22-year-old Graciela Gomez, a Nevada National Guard soldier who had no involvement whatsoever in the sour confrontation. She died from her injuries while two other bystanders were shot and injured. Poor quality surveillance footage made it impossible to identify any suspects or key people who might provide useful information. According to authorities, multiple partygoers fled the scene before police got there, further hampering the investigation and forcing law enforcement to issue a statement urging people to come forward with what they knew. Even the smallest piece of the puzzle could potentially help detectives get to the bottom of the case, but they never got what they were hoping for. The investigation hit a standstill, and Graciela's murder remains unsolved to this day. Number 9. Joey Harris In 2020, Cynthia Mose and her family decided to celebrate her 56th birthday. They held a one-year memorial for her brother's death at the same time. Cynthia attended the event at a home in East Palo Alto with her on-and-off boyfriend of two years, 55-year-old Joey Harris. The couple were in the process of breaking up at the time, and Harris allegedly grew jealous of Mose at the party. They got into an argument, and Harris stepped away briefly to go to his car. According to witnesses, he came back with a handgun and loudly commanded Mose to go with him. Shortly after leaving the building, Mose was fatally shot in the chest and back. Harris fled the scene in his car and went to his home in Stockton. He turned himself into the police just one day later, along with the gun that was used to kill Cynthia. The accused killer pleaded not guilty to murder and spent the next three years behind bars at the San Mateo County Jail on a $10 million bail. A jury officially convicted Harris of first-degree murder in March 2023. According to his records, he is currently awaiting sentencing for the crime. Number 8. Abby Flynn 59-year-old Abby Flynn's friends were confused when they got to her house in Gloucester, Massachusetts for a Super Bowl party back in 2020, and she wasn't there. Her phone was still on her kitchen counter, and there was even food in the oven, but Abby was not in the building. Her keys, wallet, and dog were also left at the home. It was unlike Abby to pull a vanishing act like this, especially when she was expecting company or to leave the house without any of her belongings. Worried that something bad could have happened to the retired nurse and mother of three, her friends called the police and the search was quickly launched. The last person to speak with Abby before she went missing was her son, who spoke with her on the phone around 4 p.m. that day. During the conversation, Abby said that she planned to take a walk before the party started. She was last seen outside in the neighborhood about 30 minutes later. 
At the time of Abby's disappearance, her husband Rich was in a different city, Houston, where he worked as a radiologist. He immediately flew back to Massachusetts after learning that his wife went missing, and police later ruled him out as a suspect. Abby's brother Brian told NBC News that his sister and her husband had a nice life and enjoyed a happy marriage. There was no reason for Abby to walk away from her picture-perfect life, and her loved ones were confident she would never do that. Law enforcement searched the area extensively, but found no trace of the missing woman. Abby's fate remains a mystery to this day, and the investigation is at a standstill. Police are hoping someone will eventually come forward with information that will help bring them closer to answers. Number 7. Teodoro Macias In April 2021, two families got together for a birthday party at a mobile home in Colorado Springs. Shortly after midnight, an armed intruder barged into the property and opened fire on the group. Later identified as 28-year-old Teodoro Macias, he shot the victims one after the other, making it clear he was there for the express purpose of carrying out a massacre. Three people called 911, including a partygoer who managed to escape the bullets and a neighbor who reported rapid gunfire. Seven people lost their lives, including the person whose birthday it was, the shooter's girlfriend, Sandra Ibarra Perez, and Macias himself. Three people who left the party with plans to come back a little while later survived miraculously thanks to their timing. Macias and Ibarra Perez had been dating for a little over a year leading up to the shooting. Those who knew the pair described their relationship as incredibly toxic. According to police, Macias had intense control and jealousy issues. He kept Ibarra Perez on a short leash and was outraged when he wasn't invited to the party and she went without him. While Macias had no prior criminal record, he had a clear history of possessive behavior, which included his attempts to isolate his girlfriend from her family members. When Ibarra Perez finally went against his orders, she and five other innocent people paid for it with their lives. Number 6. Carly Carroll in 2017, during her sophomore year at the University of North Texas, Carly Carroll grew increasingly frustrated with her upstairs neighbors' constant partying at all hours of the night. And it wasn't just the noise that irritated her. When these disruptive gatherings were going on, she noticed that her ceiling seemed to bounce up and down from the weight of the partygoers dancing as if it were on the verge of collapsing. Carly complained to the police multiple times but nothing was ever done to stop the parting. In fact, the problem got even worse. After a major football win one night, the neighbor threw their biggest event yet. About 100 people crammed into the tiny third floor apartment. People were too busy dancing and having fun to notice that the weakened floor had become dangerously unstable. Things got even crazier when a popular local DJ showed up and started spinning music at full blast volume. At that point, Carly and her roommates were seriously concerned for their safety. Determined to finally put the problem behind them, they went to the police station to file yet another complaint. In the meantime, just as the girls predicted, the floor opened up and swallowed at least a half dozen partygoers, who plunged directly into Carly's apartment below, along with furniture, half-full liquor bottles, and the structural supports that had given way under their massive weight. Chaos broke out as people scrambled to avoid falling into the hole, leaving some guests trapped on narrow stretches of floor as they clung to the wall for dear life. Carly and her friends were still at the police station when they heard that their home had been completely destroyed. They were lucky to be safe, but lost almost all their personal belongings and were now among the building's 50 or so residents who were homeless thanks to the damage. It would be unrealistic for someone to live in a building full of college students and expect no late night noise, but this wasn't exactly the case with Carly and her roommates. The problem was constant and they knew they were going to be in danger if it continued. Number five, Charles Robert Smith. In 2023, a high school graduation party turned into a nightmare outside an Annapolis, Maryland home after an argument over a parking space quickly led to bloodshed. The party's host, 27-year-old Mario Antonio Mareles Ruiz, his father, 55-year-old Nicholas Mareles, and 25-year-old Christian Marlon Segovia, were killed from bullet wounds by the time police got to the scene. 
Three other partygoers were struck by gunfire and lived. According to court documents, a partygoer's car was blocking the driveway where 43-year-old Charles Robert Smith lived with his mother. Smith's mom complained to the police and Mario Morellas went to the house to try straightening the situation out. A confrontation later broke out between Morellas and Smith and the men started wrestling over a gun. Morellas was shot during the fierce struggle. Authorities accused Smith of standing over Morellas and firing off several bullets into his body, as well as shooting Christian Segovia who was standing close by. Smith ran into his house as neighbors and partygoers rushed to the scene to help victims. He opened fire from inside, killing Mario's dad Nicholas as he tended to his bleeding son. Police arrested Smith at the property and booked him into custody on three counts of second-degree murder. Smith is also currently facing three counts of attempted second-degree murder, three counts of first-degree assault, and one count of using a firearm during the commission of a violent crime. Records suggest that the shootings were not caused by a one-off disagreement, but instead a long-standing dispute between neighbors dating back years. In 2016, Smith's mom filed for a peace order against Mario Morellas, accusing him of threatening her and hitting her car with a wet towel. She also claimed that she'd seen him throwing rocks at street signs and other vehicles. Morellas accused the elderly woman of being racist and speeding toward him with her car when he was minding his own business, standing outside. In a police complaint, he wrote that it was the first time he had ever thought that his life was in imminent danger. In the days after the mass shooting, reporters from the Baltimore Banner spoke to people who knew Smith to try and learn more about what kind of person he truly was. They interviewed 21-year-old John Maynard, who said that he became friends with Smith after meeting in a reptile enthusiast group they took part in online. Maynard later sold five snakes to Smith, and they bonded over their shared hobby. They became fishing buddies, caught snakes, and often explored nature together at a nearby state park. When he learned about Smith's arrest, Maynard said he was completely shocked, but that Smith had previously opened up to him about being a military veteran with PTSD. He remembered several instances where Smith was triggered by sudden loud noises and music, triggering emotional meltdowns and causing him to physically throw items. In one instance, the men got stuck in a traffic jam and the constant sound of car horns caused Smith to repeatedly punch the steering wheel while lashing out. Maynard said he helped his troubled older friend calm down through deep breathing exercises and took over the driving that day. But it seems nobody was around to talk Smith down on the day of the graduation party massacre and his apparent lack of self-control cost three people their lives. Number 4. Arpana Janaga After moving to the United States from India, Arpana Janaga earned her college degree at Rutgers University in New Jersey after years of hard work. She graduated in 2008 and landed a comfy software engineering job in Seattle, where she settled into her new life and made many friends. Later that year, the 24-year-old and her neighbors threw a Halloween party at their apartment building, where they often hung out in the hallways and visited each other's homes. Photos from the get-together showed the young woman looking like she was having a good time as she walked around in a little red riding hood costume with a glass of wine in her hand. By the time Arpana failed to show up at work two days later, her parents had already tried to call her multiple times from India. A family friend who lived in the area went to check on her and saw that the lock on the front door to her apartment was broken and the door jamb was damaged. They went into the unit and discovered Arpana lying dead on the floor at the foot of her bed, naked and covered up with a sheet. She was covered in blunt force injuries and had even been gagged with duct tape. The killer went to great lengths to destroy any evidence. The apartment was wiped clean with bleach, and there were burn marks on the carpet where they had apparently tried to light the place on fire. Arpana's fingernails were scrubbed clean and covered in toilet bowl cleaner, and her lower body was doused in motor oil. Neighbors told police officers that they had heard muffled moaning sounds from Arpana's apartment not long after she was last seen standing in her doorway. They assumed it was simply a consensual encounter. For over an hour later, they heard running water and figured that the young woman was taking a really long shower. 
Investigators later identified two male DNA profiles on the duct tape that was used to gag Alpana and a motor oil bottle that was carelessly left behind at the scene. The DNA belonged to a neighbor and a friend of a tenant who were both at the apartment during the party. DNA from other partygoers was found elsewhere at the scene, but because people were in and out of each other's apartments during the night, it wasn't very useful in narrowing down a suspect. Two years after Arpana's murder, authorities confidently charged Emmanuel Fair in connection to the crime. He had been questioned shortly after the murder and admitted to being one of the 50 or so people who stopped at Arpana's apartment during the party. Investigators claimed that they found traces of Fair's DNA on several key pieces of evidence, including the duct tape, a bloody rope that was in a dumpster outside the building, and Arpana's neck where she was strangled. Authorities also identified some inconsistencies in Fair's story. Cell phone data showed that he had interacted with a few different women over a three-hour period, during which he originally claimed he was asleep. There were also calls to the woman whose apartment Fair said he was staying at, leading police to suspect that he was lying about his whereabouts. Fair maintained his innocence while he spent the next nine years awaiting trial in a jail cell. His attorneys accused law enforcement of targeting him because he was the only African-American man at the party and because he had a prior criminal history. They identified several other possible suspects, including a fellow member of the motorcycle club Arpana had recently joined, who had allegedly been harassing her, and a man she was seeing at the time. The defense also claimed the evidence had been mishandled by investigators and argued that the DNA technology to identify the suspect was actually faulty. The company that performed the testing fought tooth and nail to avoid revealing their methods in court out of a fear that it would put their trade secrets at risk. It was one of the major reasons the case dragged on for so long while Fair wasted away behind bars, unable to afford bail. Fair's first trial ended in a hung jury. During the second, the jury also became deadlocked, but they continued to deliberate and eventually came to a consensus. After spending almost a decade of his life behind bars for a crime he insisted he didn't commit, Emmanuel Fair was found not guilty and was finally released. Alpana's murder remains unsolved to this day. Number 3. Adam Sapakowski when 52-year-old James Sapakowski and his wife Allison mysteriously went radio silent in 2005, worried relatives from out of town requested a welfare check at the couple's home in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Police tracked down their teenage son, Adam, at a nearby Marriott Hotel. He said that his parents were out of town in Texas, but law enforcement were still suspicious and obtained a search warrant for the family's home. When police went into the property, they were immediately hit by a foul stench coming from behind a door that was barricaded by several chairs. Behind it, they found James and Allison's bodies wrapped up in blankets. They had been there for several weeks after getting shot multiple times at close range. Nearby, there was a blood-spattered report card from an expensive private school. It belonged to Adam, who had many issues with his parents thanks to his poor grades. Investigators discovered the murder weapon and some camping gear inside a car in the garage, making it seem as if Adam was planning to flee. Neighbors told police officers that they had recently noticed a terrible smell coming from the home. When they asked Adam about it, he blamed it on spoiled food in the fridge. It was later revealed that Adam had attended his junior prom with his girlfriend on the weekend his parents were murdered, and he even threw a party at the home afterward. He spent most of the next two weeks at a Marriott hotel before being arrested for the crime. Prosecutors claimed that James and Allison Sapakowski had banned their son from going to prom because of his failing grades, and that Adam shot his mother and father so he could still attend the dance. They depicted the defendant as a privileged and spoiled young man who believed he was above the rules and killed his parents so he could live how he wanted without their disapproval. Adam's defense attorney said that James Sapakowski had provoked the shootings by mentally and physically abusing his child. Shortly before the double murder, he had allegedly threatened to hit Adam with a baseball bat. Court records showed that one of Adam's friends referred to James Sapakowski as Psycho Dad because he was always screaming at Adam. The teen's sister, Lauren, denied Adam's many claims of abuse. She said their parents loved them unconditionally and did everything they possibly could to give their children good lives. 
The young defendant spent over a year in a psychiatric facility as the court grappled over his mental condition. Adam claimed he started hearing voices a few years earlier and that his mental state deteriorated under constant pressure from his parents, who accused him of not working hard enough to do well in school. His lawyers considered entering an insanity plea or arguing for a diminished responsibility ruling, but ended up settling on a simple plea agreement. Adam pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice and two counts of second-degree murder. He received consecutive sentences of 19 to 24 and a half years in prison for his father's murder and 25 years for killing his mother. According to state prison records, he's expected to get released in 2045. Number 2. Matthew Hervey Unfortunately, shootings at parties are very common in the United States, and graduation parties are no exception to this trend. When gunfire broke out at a home inside an upscale gated community in Indio, California during 2023, it served as a sobering reminder that violence happens across all social classes and no one is immune to it. Police responded to the scene around midnight after getting calls about multiple shots fired. They arrived and found 18-year-old Matthew Hervey dead from two gunshot wounds. Three other victims had also been hit and were taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Police spokesperson Benjamin Guitron told NBC Palm Springs that the community where the shooting happened is usually pretty quiet. He described it as a nice area but pointed out that it's almost impossible to predict these types of situations. Gutran said there were a lot of people at the party and that investigators were still working to identify a suspect. Authorities have released few details about the case and have declined to speculate on what led up to the shooting. No arrests have been made yet and police have appealed to the public for information in hopes of getting to the bottom of this unsettling case. Number 1. Joseph McCrimmon after celebrating her birthday with her mother and sisters at their Brooklyn apartment in 2021, a young girl was woken up by arguing and gunshots from outside her bedroom late one night. She hid in her closet until the noise died down and came out to find her mom, 45-year-old Rashida Bazi, dead thanks to bullet wounds. Her sisters, Salai and Chloe Spears, had also been fatally shot. When investigating the scene, police located the body of 46-year-old Joseph McCrimmon, Rashida Bazi's ex and the father of her surviving daughter. McCrimmon's relationship with Bazi had a rocky history dating back 20 years, but his motive for committing the horrific crime was unclear. Police confirmed that they did not get any 911 calls or complaints about the couple leading up to the shooting, but they knew Bazi and McCrimmon had a difficult past and that McCrimmon was in an agitated state when he drove to Bazi's home the night of the crime. A downstairs neighbor told the New York Times that she overheard arguing at the apartment many times, but that she didn't hear any yelling before the gunshots rang out. After the first two shots, the neighbor heard someone screaming out in pain. Three more shots rang out and were followed by deafening silence. McCrimmon had a lengthy criminal record dating at least as far back as 1995 when he was convicted of manslaughter in the shooting death of a sanitation worker. He served five years in prison for this and was paroled in 2000. Thirteen years later, McCrimmon pleaded guilty to bank robbery and was sentenced to five years. He served only four after persuading an appeals court to reduce his time, despite federal prosecutors making a note in his file that he was an unlikely candidate for rehabilitation. Given the missed opportunities to keep McCrimmon locked up and the unusual amount of forgiveness afforded to him by the justice system, it's hard not to wonder if this heartbreaking tragedy could have been prevented. Attorney Andrew Rubin, who represented McCrimmon in the bank robbery case, told the Rockland Westchester Journal News that Rashida Bazi was one of his client's biggest supporters throughout the case. He described McCrimmon as having a limited capacity and said that Bazi helped him out tremendously. Knowing that the victim had compassion for her lover only makes the crime seem even more devastating. Thanks for watching. If you were given an opportunity to take back one stupid mistake from your life, what would it be and why? Let us know in the comments below.